and welcome to Leadership PRN. My name is Dr. Lara Hazelton. I'm the Director of Faculty Development at the Faculty of Medicine, and this podcast is for leaders across the medical spectrum. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Emma McDermott. Hello, Emma. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. And I'm really pleased that you're here because uh, you're a medical student, and we don't often get to hear about medical students' um, perspectives on leadership. So it's great uh, that, that you're able to share that with us today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Emma, and what uh, led you to be interested in leadership? Yeah, for sure. So I'm from Prince Edward Island originally, and kind of throughout my junior high and high school experience was often thrown into leadership roles because I definitely embraced the say yes mentality whenever someone asked me to do something. Um, And then kind of continued that throughout my undergrad, master's, and now into my fourth year of medical school. Um, Haven't really had much formal leadership training throughout my experience so far. So I've been really excited to be a part of the Dalhousie Medicine community and kind of fostering those skills. And yeah, looking forward to chatting more about that today. So you're someone who's been interested in leadership for a while then, it sounds like. Yes, for sure. Which is a bit different than some doctors I talk to who d- discover their interest in leadership after they get into practice. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that medical students aren't necessarily thinking of is part of the entire clinical practice, even though it is one of the can men's roles, um, that that leadership takes both formal and informal roles throughout our practice. And the moment you kind of become a physician, the community sees you as a leader, whether you are in a position or not. Um, So I think it's definitely something that we should be fostering in our medical students going forward. And some of your experiences so far, as I I, I think you received a nice award recently from Doctors Nova Scotia. Yeah, I was selected for the Most Outstanding Medical Student Award uh, in June of last year for my advocacy on planetary health. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. I was really excited. (laughs) And uh, some of your um, advocacy work, do you want to just briefly tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So prior to medical school, I did a master's in global affairs where I specialized in global health and environmental sustainability and kind of bringing that into the medical school world, focusing on planetary health and the kind of the threats of climate change. So as an up and coming physician, it's going to be a huge part of my practice every day. We're already seeing the effects now and five years down the line, we're going to be seeing it even more. So it's something I've been involved in since I started here uh, with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, Nova Scotia. I'm a co-founder for the Dalmed Green team, which is the first student-led group. I was lucky to be elected as the co-chair for CFMS Heart, the Canadian Federation of Medical Students Health and Environment Adaptive Response Task Force last year. So kind of leading the national movement as well too. Um, and yeah, I've been taking on various projects on that front. That's really interesting because sometimes um, we talk about in leadership people finding their why, like finding the thing that really motivates them to to want to lead. And it, it sounds like for you, a big part of it maybe is environmental sustainability. Yeah, kind of that whole general realm of health system change. And that's kind of been a big part of it because I'm seeing that it's not necessarily the most recognized part of things that we need to be changing right now. And we're kind of on a tight timeline for it. So kind of where most of my area has focused so far. You uh, mentioned that you haven't had much formal training in leadership, and um, one of the reasons I know about you, well, I think I knew about you because a few years ago we were planning a a conference in faculty development on uh, the environment, and that one unfortunately got canceled due to COVID, but then um, there was another one, uh, I think it was last year maybe. Yeah, the FEAR the Memorial Fear, Conference. Exactly, yeah. So, I, so I've met you, and I think you did a grand rounds for our, our department of psychiatry um, as well. But then, more recently, you connected with me because you're doing a leadership elective. Yeah. So in our med four year, we have more unstructured clinical time where we get to kind of pick and choose the areas of medicine that we'd like to spend more time in in two week rotations. And we get to do nine of those throughout the year. Uh, And the way they were kind of described to me was that it could be very open ended and anything you kind of wanted to explore further for your career. And to me, my career as a physician is much more than just the specialty that I'm going to choose. Um, So I kind of came up with this idea that I wanted to explore medical leadership and kind of the different options and scope of what that could possibly entail, whether it's more formal positions such as administration and department heads, or is it being in part of Doctors Nova Scotia or advocacy and kind of what were the options available for me for my future career. Um, So got connected with Dr. Short from the Department of Medicine. Christine Uh, Short. Yes. And got to kind of 
make this rotating elective where I got to do days and a half days with different medical leaders um, here at Dalhousie. And it's been a great two-week experience. And um, you shadowed me because uh, even though I have this role in faculty development, that is why I do this podcast, I'm also um, deputy head for psychiatry. So you had the chance, I guess, to watch us revising some terms of reference. And <laughs> Yeah, no, it was definitely enlightening. <laughs> what are some of the things that you've learned so far from the leaders you're shadowing? Oh, I've learned a tremendous amount, um, kind of that many leaders had similar pathways to me without that formal leadership training. And it's just they just kind of the opportunities knocked on their door and they took them and tried their best and getting that feedback along the way and how important that is to kind of shape your leadership strategy, um, as well as how much of it is really based on your people skills and those relationships that you build and building that trust with your team and working on lifting them up. Um, and yeah, just kind of making sure that you're giving your best and giving your all and really building those relationships with your team. Is there anything that you've heard that sort of surprised you, do you think? I think the big emphasis on those formal versus informal leaders and it's how you present yourself in the room is kind of what determines whether the room sees you as a leader or not, not the title that necessarily is going to follow your name. Uh, and even though all of the people that I've shadowed in the selective do have those titles after their name, um, they were given those titles because they were leaders in the room in an informal capacity. So that's definitely something to strive for for me. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I think the idea of credibility for, for leaders and um, how people can sort of inspire people to to want to act in, in a particular mm -hmm. way. Anyone can hold a leadership position, but not everyone can be considered a leader. Tell us a little bit about what you consider to be a good leader. That's a great question. Definitely something I've been putting a lot of thought into over the years. Um, and I think one of the best pieces of advice that I've received on what makes a good leader is to be authentic. Uh, and it kind of goes back to that initial leads framework of starting with the L of lead with yourself um, and knowing yourself and knowing what your values are and what's important to you and kind of bringing that forward into your leadership role, making sure that you're being respectful to those around you, making sure that you're taking the time to appropriately listen and not just listen to respond, but listen to understand and kind of being there and open for your team. I think the best leaders that I've encountered are the ones that kind of make that space and feel approachable and that you know that you can bring up your concerns without kind of having to edit your thoughts or spend an excessive amount of time figuring out how you're going to present it. You can just say, hey, this is what's bothering me. This is what I need help with. And you know that it's going to be heard and that they're going to give you their best effort to help. I think it's interesting because we do a lot of, um, so we offer leadership programming through the Faculty of Medicine. We have the um, Emerging Leaders in Academic Medicine program for faculty and then also for residents. And we talk about leadership identity quite a bit. And um, there's this balance, I guess, between authenticity and also adapting your approach to meet the needs of other people. Um, so have you thought about that? People should be authentic, but at the same time, we want them to not bring their own needs to the leadership position. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I think so, yeah. And I think it kind of gets into those different leadership styles as well, too. And what tends to be the comfort style for some people might be seen as unauthentic when they switch to use those other styles. But I think that those styles are just the resources that you can use to kind of show your leadership skills and that there is a time and place for each of those styles and that every leader needs to be able to switch those styles. So sometimes that you need to be a little bit more direct in your leadership and other times you can be more on that collaborative side of things or you can be more accommodating. Um, and I think what makes a good leader is the ability to read the room and figure out which style is needed to reach that same common and goal that everyone in the room hopefully has um, and to be able to switch your style up and how you're presenting yourself to kind of make sure that you're still on task and getting the job done. When you think about leadership, um, you mentioned that you're interested in learning about it, but we had Dr. David Bowes on the podcast um, a while ago talking about leadership education for residents and um, also uh, Dr. Varn Dev um, talking about his experiences. And, and one of the questions that comes up is, when do you start educating people about leadership? Is it um, best to do it when you're still in medical school? Or is it something that should come later when you're in residency or in practice? Because there's so many things you have to learn in medical school, mm -hmm. right? 
I definitely am one that believes that it should be coming out in medical school, if not even before that, in high school and undergrad and things as well, too, because we are holding leadership positions while in medical school. So we have the Dalhousie Medical Student Society here that is run entirely by medical students. We have people holding positions on national boards. We're doing large scale national advocacy projects, and we're not necessarily talking about what it means to be a good leader when you're doing those roles. And it's kind of a little bit of trial by fire. You figure it out as you go. Um, so some definitely formal leadership education would, I think, would be helpful in that regard. And we talk about the CanMed's roles. We talk about how leader is being a part of that. But I still think many medical students have that kind of narrow scope of what that means. It means you're going to be a department head or something like that along the lines. And I think it's so much bigger than that. So how would you think, because um, some students are more interested in formal positional leadership than others. How do you think it's something that should be incorporated in the curriculum for everyone or should it be something that's offered outside the curriculum hours to people with like let's say a role with the Dalhousie Medical Student Society? What what are your thoughts about how it should be? I think those that are looking for it are definitely going to find those informal non-curriculum roles and get involved with the Dalhousie Medical Student Society. I think electives like this are a great option for those that have an interest. They can kind of take that time and dedicate to it. Ideally, would love to see it in the curriculum for everyone, but I know that's going to definitely take its time because um, there's limited space, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, that's my sense as well. Um, if it were going to be in the curriculum for everyone, have you thought about like med one, med two? What I kind? think in med one, when you kind of have those introductions to what are the can med roles and even that definition of leadership that's provided to us then and really kind of trying to place that emphasis on it. And as we do our cases throughout med one and med two, we're supposed to be relating back to the can meds roles. So kind of taking that a little bit step further and bringing in that leadership side of things. We do have one case in particular that focuses on advocacy and projects and kind of I think defining and making that connection to leadership through that a little bit better would be good too. Do you want to say a little bit more about that, the connection between advocacy and leadership? Yeah. So I think it's definitely, as physicians, we're kind of held in a high regard by the general public. Um, and we're considered one of the most trusted professions when it comes to different health issues and even non-health related issues. Um, so I think we definitely have a position to use our voices for good and to make that systems change. So really being able to do that effectively and training our future physicians to be good advocates. How do you interact? with the media? How do you decide which issue is something you need to focus on? What are the critical thinking skills that you require to be able to address that issue well and think about all the possible repercussions that could come from any of your interventions? And this is probably why I'm interested in potentially pursuing public health. <laughs> right. Oh, is that your, uh, your area? Possibly, that yeah. Or emergency interested? medicine. What are the oh, two? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, both uh, areas that have lots of um, systemic aspects, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, although probably most areas of medicine do have systemic aspects. They yeah. do, yeah. And that's why I think it's so much more than just the specialty you pick. So what do you think that medical students can teach the rest of us about leadership in 2023? I think medical students bring a lot of passion to their work. Um, we're on the younger side of things, so we're definitely new and starting out in our careers and have our big dreams and aspirations. And I think with that, we also prioritize things a little bit differently. I think our generation definitely values work-life balance, um, making sure that we're having that positive change and we're doing things for good, as well as in particularly with the climate crisis, we recognize that this is something that's going to be a part of our everyday careers and is going to impact our lifespan. So making sure that we're putting that at the forefront of our thoughts and making it a priority. And I think that's something that I hope our current leaders will be listening to. Thinking about the, the positive change aspect, um, sometimes change is difficult to see happen. Um, have you encountered that already in your... Yeah, it takes a long time. So it's slow. So I use the example from when I was in undergrad. I wanted to make my university a smoke-free campus. So started off with the petitions and all of those things in my first year of medical school and felt like I was shut down and it was a no, or sorry, not medical school of my undergrad. Um, 
felt like I was kind of shut down as they weren't interested in this, da da da. And then in my fourth year, as I was graduating, it came out that they were making a smoke free campus. And that was really exciting to see that that laid the groundwork. Um, wasn't as fast as I had initially liked it, but showed that over time that they had to get that stakeholder engagement and come in with a plan and kind of consider residents and all of those other aspects and staff and faculty and kind of with their contracts and rights. Um, so yeah, it takes some time, but you can definitely get there. And um, you mentioned about work-life balance as well. Do you think that that's something that is going to be different for your generation than it is for maybe other generations of physicians? Yeah, I hope my generation definitely has a different definition of work-life balance. So recognizing that it's not just your balance between your job and then your personal life, it kind of all mixes together and you're never going to have those two things in perfect balance at one snapshot point in time. So kind of making sure that what things are waxing and waning in different areas to overall have that balance over a period of time. And then within your job as well, too, finding that balance. So your balance between your clinical time and your academic time and your extracurricular time. And then within each of those roles, making sure you have the appropriate time to prep and do the meetings and do the follow-up. Um, so I think there's lots of areas that we need to have balance. And it's not just that clear-cut work versus life. Is there anything else that you wanted to add about your perspectives that you've gained in, in your leadership work, really, that you've already been doing um, for the last, well, four years, more than four years? Yeah, um, I would just say that it is definitely a lifelong learning experience. And each of the positions that I've ever taken on, I have been so thankful for because I've learned something new in each of them, even though they can be considered quite similar to each other by the end when you start to add them all up. Um, but you gain something different when each of those teams that you work on. And it's something that I'm hoping I'm learning the positive things to kind of take on to the next one. What is your next one? Great question. Residency <laughs> is soon, so we'll find out. <laughs> Are you imagining taking on leadership roles in residency as well? I definitely will see myself doing that. Yeah. yeah? Like with resident associations possibly or something? Yeah. Or? Social chairs to kind of organize residence groups, definitely being involved further with the planetary health, choosing wisely the different issues that I'm passionate about. Thanks very much for joining us today, Emma. Thank you very much for having me. I had a lot of fun. And thanks for listening to another episode of Leadership PRN. If you have ideas about topics you would like to hear or guests you would like me to interview, please feel free to reach out to me at lara.hazelton at nshealth.ca or lara.hazelton at dal.ca. Until next time, take care. Mm -hmm.